Good evening and welcome to this special edition of Wildfire Watch. Tonight we're going to explore what happened in Maui and how the lessons learned from this tragic event and other recent wildfires can help us be better prepared for wildfires here in Marin. I'm Rich Shortall, Executive Officer of FireSafe Marin. Shortly we'll hear from our local wildfire experts and respond to your questions, but first let's watch a short video of scenes from the tragic fire in Lahaina. On behalf of all of us here tonight and in Marin, I'd like to express our shared concern and compassion for the people in Lahaina and for all those affected by this tragic event. For our viewers who would like to help through donations, you can contribute to Maui Strong at the address that we're gonna put up on the screen or any one of very many reputable relief organizations. We do thank you for your willingness to help out. So to join the conversation tonight, please post your questions in the Q&A function within Zoom. We'll try to address as many as questions we can live, but any questions we can't get to, we'll have a written answer posted in a couple days on our website. So please look for those along with the recording of tonight's show at firesafemarin.org and the Firesafe Marin YouTube channel. So let's begin our conversation by introducing our guests. To my right here is Jason Weber. He's Marin County's Fire Chief. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Rich. Next is Mark Brown, Executive Officer of, Fire Sa of Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Thanks for putting Welcome, us Mark. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And of course, many of you will recognize Todd Marin, Central Marin Fire Department Battalion Chief. So I want to welcome all of you here tonight, and I really appreciate you making the time for this important event. So to begin with, let's see if we can do a little com comparison between Maui and Marin County. Mark, what are sort of the demographics and terrain that we find in Maui? Well, we, we know that Maui is obviously an island, and uh, those who live in Marin know that Marin is essentially a peninsula, right? Um, Maui is about 100 square miles smaller than Marin. It has about 100,000 fewer residents, but we know Maui has a, a, a huge population in tourism. But I think one of the key differences is that Maui is an island. Marin is connected to Sonoma County. And we also have access to our other counties uh, via the Richmond Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge. And then also just look, let's look at the climate. We're a Mediterranean cl climate versus a tropical climate. Yeah. So um, I think there's also some dif differences in building construction. Todd, you want to talk about that? Yeah, you know, California and Marin have a benefit of having adopted some of the strictest wildfire building standards anywhere in the world uh, more than a decade ago. And the reality is we started transitioning away from fire uh, vulnerable roofs more than 30 years ago. So we do have a, a building uh, standard that's better than uh, what you might see in a place like Maui where we focused on wildfires and they've focused on tropical storm protection for homes. So, so what we're starting to see some benefits is our building stock is uh, remodeled and, and constructed to the latest standards. Uh, that said, we're still vulnerable and, and they were obviously. Yeah, well, unfortunately it looks like, I think, unfortunately in that area too, a lot of wood construction buildings on the older side a lot of um, things that are sold to tourists kind of out and about. And of course, I think they have like breezeways and things between that. I, 
yeah, you know, when you live in, an, in that kind of climate where they're exposed to heat and, and high humidity, they have to allow for a lot of airflow. So those buildings are designed with breezeways that channel the winds, the, the prevailing winds through the buildings to provide cooling. It's necessary. It provides drying and reduces the moisture effects on the buildings. So, so that's part of the building construction that really has to be part of building in a tropical climate. Um, I, and frankly, you know, the early indications are that that's a significant wildfire vulnerability when you're exposed to embers. Yeah, I think we'll talk more about um, how that contributed to the fire spread there. Um, probably one of the bigger differences, Chief, is in resources for firefighting that are available. Yeah, thank you, Fritch. Um, as you know, they've mentioned this is an island. It's restricted to what's available. Um, on the uh, on the island, and they have about 10 engine companies available to them um, on the island, and it takes a long time to get more. Um, when you look at Marin, you know we've got almost 40 engines staffed daily, and we have the capacity during red flag events or predicted events to add staffing to that. Um, you know they have one helicopter available to, on the island for firefighting uh, purposes. Uh, you know, we have um, one aircraft that's provided uh, this year by PG&E, which we're very grateful for, located at Noss Field, so it carries 900 gallons um, compared to some of the Bambi buckets that are used on the smaller helicopters of 150. We also have the state's uh, Air Force really available to us, um, the largest firefighting Air Force anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, the flight time from Santa Rosa to Marin, where, the, where their fixed wing's located, it's about 12 minutes and it's about 20 maybe 30 minutes for uh, the rotary ring stuff from the state. So we have a lot of resources available to us, which we're thankful for. And as Mark mentioned, we have two bridges and, and a landmass into Sonoma County and access to a lot of firefighting resources under the mutual aid system. And so that, that's a big benefit here for us. Yeah, so oftentimes we can get very quickly on the fires with a lot of resources, still catastrophic events, always tough, but uh, definitely an advantage to us. Um, let's talk about the fire behavior during this particular event. It seemed pretty extreme. Mark, you want to discuss that? Well, let's talk actually before the fire ignited, and that was the issuance of red flag warnings. And I'm not sure how many people are used to hearing about red flag warnings in Lahaina and how much credence they put it and how much, how they change their day based on the red flag warnings. Um, in Marin, we echo the National Weather Service's red flag warnings we we do our best to make sure all our residents know about it and thanks to a lot of the training and public education from fire safe Marin, our residents know what to do under fire red flag warning conditions they're getting their go bags ready they're backing their cars into their homes they have fuel in their cars and they have a heightened awareness of what's going on around them so that if a fire comes up then they're actually ready to go and they're actually looking for the fires those fires to occur to be ready to evacuate um, but you know, reports of 80 miles an hour wind conditions. Uh, you're hard pressed to find 80 mile an hour wind conditions down on the, the valley floors and within the slopes. It's usually, you're, it's a rare event that you're gonna get those speeds up on the ridge lines. And then let's talk about, um, you know, the, 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 the um, vegetation that was in Lahaina and that was uh, sugarcane and, and, and pineapple. Well, they've stopped harvesting those, and those fields have gone fallow, and now we have highly combustible non-native grasses with, that create rapid rates of spread. They're so tall that they, you know, they're, they're, they're putting out flame links that we don't normally see from grass, and, and unfortunately, these went right up against the homes. There was no separation. Mark, I want to piggyback on one thing there, and you know, how do we make our residents aware of a red flag? So the fire chiefs collectively across the county have have used Nixel, and so we are we are um, sending out a Nixel every day. There's a red flag event uh, that occurs. Um, the Nixel goes out roughly by noon, um, and and we want to make sure we do that. So folks that aren't registered for Nixel, that's a that's a good opportunity also to get that information, and then of course our local news stations. Great. Well, we'll put it in the chat um, to remind people how to sign up for um, for Nixel and, of course, sign up for Alert Marin. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But if you're not uh, alerted about these or warned about these events, it's not going to help you at all. So that's that's very important to do. 
Um, who, who is it that creates red flag, the warning in the first place? Todd, where's that come from? It comes from meteorologists at the National Weather Service. It's not issued by the fire departments. It's not a decision that's made here. It's made by meteorologists who are looking for, for weather conditions that have the potential to contribute to rapid fire growth, rapid fire spread. And there's a whole range of weather conditions that, that can contribute to a red flag warning. The ones we're most concerned about are the ones that, that have the strong northeast winds typically in the Bay Area. Um, but there, you know, the dry lightning and some other things can also contribute to a red flag warning. But when you hear the red flag warning issued for the strong northeast winds in Marin, it's really time to, to take notice and get yourself prepared long before a fire starts. Yeah, I did understand that a couple of days before the event too, that the weather conditions were really dry. So super low humidity, so all the plants dry out, right? Yeah. And with the plants dried out there, they're more susceptible. And then along come the big winds. And the only thing we're missing is a source of ignition which unfortunately is what happened there. Um, and oftentimes on those days, we find fires in multiple locations. Uh, I think that was a contributing factor uh, in Maui. Do we know much about that? Yeah, we know what the reports say at this point. I think we wanna be very careful not to, to second guess or Monday morning quarterback what occurred over there. They're gonna go through their own um, you know, study of, of lessons learned. But what we do know is that the islands are very limited in size, limited fire resources, and um, you know they, they did have multiple fires, and, and that's part of the challenge that they were experiencing that day. Right. So I uh, apologize to everybody that the echo we had at the beginning, I believe that that's been fixed. Um, let's see if we could take some questions here. Um, so uh, one of the, some of these we're gonna get to a little bit later on, so I think maybe we'll, again, I remind everybody to Please submit your questions so that we can get to them. We're gonna take a break in between the sections. We really don't have very many right now, so I think we'll just move on to the next section. Um, so what are some of the lessons from these fires that we've learned from Marin County? Not just the fire in Lahaina, but also other fires that we are, know about. So uh, Rich, in 2017, after the, the terrible devastating fires in the North Bay, the Marin County Board of Supervisors commissioned a lesson learned study and they really wanted to focus on, you know, what can we do and what can we change to, to not have that event occur here in Marin County. So we brought uh, law enforcement, fire, uh, uh, land managers, uh, emergency managers together, um, had very candid conversations with them on what, what they learned during those things. You know, we had many people um, participate in after action or in the incident itself and the campfire up in paradise. What what happened there? What things could be changed? Todd had somebody, a PhD professor, come down and talk about her experiences with the evacuation. Mark was the operations section chief on that fire. So we brought all their information back to Marin. Um, about that time, the grand jury was looking at this also. Uh, they interviewed a lot of people, um, got their experiences. What can we do differently here to prevent that from ever occurring? And they produced that report in 2019. And then I think in partnership with Fire Safe Marin, the fire agencies collectively went out uh, after we built a plan and said, okay, we really do need to come together. Fire does not know jurisdictional boundaries. It's gonna run from one to the other. So if we're doing fuels work or defensible space in one area but not another, we're not gonna be as effective as we could be collectively. So that's the creation of the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Uh, ultimately, our voters and members of our community supported that financially with Measure C. Uh, that has allowed us to really take leaps and bounds forward with the, the mitigation work that has to be done ahead of time for these incidents. What else has been done? The Marin County Board of Supervisors invested over a million dollars annually and ongoing in the Office of Emergency Management to make sure our alert and warning systems and the people that staff those systems uh, are prepared and ready. Um, you know, Fire Safe Marin, uh, I'll give you plenty of kudos here because I know you won't do it yourself, mm -hmm. but just at the forefront of public education and making sure that the community has the tools and resources they need. If you haven't been to Fire Safe Marin's website, you need to take a look at it. There's just a, a ton of information on there. And there's a lot of other communities in California that are using the information on that website. Um, but you know, collectively, what are we doing now? And I think Mark can talk a little bit about Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Um, some of the work they're doing with studies and, and mitigation, how that money's being spent to put us in a better place. Great. So we 
the residents of Marin took all this seriously, great studies, recommendations, went ahead, supported Measure C, created the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Can you review what it is and what it's doing? So Jason talked about that lessons learned package that we put together after evaluating the 2017 North Bay firestorms. And we came up with seven pages of action items. And there was no single agency that was charged with making sure those action items occurred, nor were they funded. So we were able to bring together 17 member agencies. We uh, divided the county into five geographical areas so that we can help uh, create the right solution for the right area. And so 60% of our budget goes towards public education, evacuation route uh, systems improvements, evacuation route clearings, uh, defensible space around homes, shaded fuel breaks along our urban interface boundaries, and grants for our residents. 20% of our budget goes towards home evaluations. So we've been averaging over 30,000 inspections each year. That's where our inspectors go and talk with our residents one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, this is what you can do to make your home safer. And then 20% goes right back to our member agencies because our fire departments, quite frankly, have such a great connection with their communities. They are the subject matter experts for what needs to happen in their communities. But big picture wise, we know that we have decades of deferred maintenance and work that needs to occur. And we know that we can't do it all at once. So we're starting with our most vital asset first, and that's our residents, and making sure that we can get them out of harm's way. And that is evacuation notification system improvements. Jason touched on some of those. The upgrades for the Office of Emergency Management, continuing to improve our integration with Nixle, Alert Marin, uh, wireless emergency alerts, or otherwise known as Amber Alerts. Um, and then we have backups with sirens and our NOAA weather radios, so that if there's a power outage, cell sites go down, you still have that NOAA ra weather radio that's gonna alert you. And then we've been working very hard to harden our evacuation routes meaning removing vegetation along those routes so that when residents evacuate, they can know that they can stay in their car and survive inside their car even if there's fire conditions on the roadway. So I regularly interact with fire councils all around California, and I will say I'm kind of proud of the work that we're doing here in Marin. We have a lot to do still, but clearly from what you're saying, we're accomplishing quite a bit. Let's talk a little bit about the alert and warning system. Uh, Jason, can you explain what the basic principles are and how it works? Absolutely. So, we, it, typically in an incident, we want to start more granular. We want to get those most immediately affected out of the area first. And that may be local law enforcement, local fire knocking on doors, or asking people to evacuate the immediate, you know, if it's initial attack, that, that first part of the fire. Um, that can be quickly followed up with um, you know, an alert Marin, which would go out to a specific area. It may be an address range, it may be a block. These are all pre-identified in our system that we recently purchased, Zone Haven. So the, the messaging is automatic. The time it takes to do that is very quick. Um, I think there's a couple important pieces here. We have a great partnership with our law enforcement agencies across the entire county. And so when an incident does occur, that, that highest ranking law enforcement officer and our usually our battalion chiefs that are running the incident are tied at the hip. And from the fire chiefs and police chiefs, we've, we've really mandated that that be the case. So there is no gap in communication between law enforcement and fire. Remember, law enforcement's uh, responsible for the evacuation carrying it out. Fire recommends that. Um, so having those two individuals connected at the hip, at the incident command post, and making those decisions together uh, in, in communication with our Office of Emergency Management on, on call officer is what allows us to move so rapidly. So that can be somewhat granular. It can be down to you know city block if it needs to be for a gas leak or something. Um, it can also be bigger swaths that are geographically done to, to make sure that traffic flow um, doesn't overburden a certain street and the time it moves. We can issue an order or a warning. An order is leave immediately. Uh, a warning is that, that there may be an order to follow, so get ready. So we really encourage our residents that know they're gonna be a little slower in the evacuation process. They should probably leave during a warning um, and, and start to gather their stuff. Make sure that go bag's ready. Make sure they have those personal belongings. That pet isn't out running scared. Their kids are accounted for. All of those things that are so important that, that are challenging. Um, Second piece is we also have WE alerts and you know the wireless emergency alert system. We can hit a much bigger area. It hits all the cell phones. Um, I think there's some important distinctions that have to be made on information versus actionable items. We're going to use Alert Marin to, for actionable items like 
a evacuation uh, warning or an order. We're going to use Nixle for information, like we spoke about earlier with the red flag warning, letting people know that there's something out there so they're more aware, they're more prepared uh, when it occurs. And then we can go all the way up to the emergency broadcast system. Um, and that really is, is very broad. It's not granular. It may cover multiple communities. Mark mentioned the, the alert weather radios. Those would be alerted or alarmed under those circumstances. So, you know, we look at this as, as what's most effective. We want to make sure the evacuation is safe, it's done in a timely manner, and it's orderly, and we don't push people unnecessarily onto roads so we can get those most affected out. Um, so those decisions are being made down at the ground level. Uh, that also will, will help advise us where to put traffic control officers. So as we're calling mutual aid law enforcement in, that software is going to help us determine where we need to, to have officers on the roadway. So those are all the systems that are in place. The other thing I think that's important to understand that we didn't have in 2017 or 2020 is aircraft that can be up 24-7 above our incident. They can look through the smoke and they can tell where that forward progress of the fire is. That's never been available to us. Um, and more technology like that's becoming available. We're, we're partnering with them. Um, there's a lot of, of systems in place, but I was a little discouraged before I came in the meeting, I asked our emergency management folks, how many people are registered for Alert Marin? And I think on the high end, it's like 65%. So we've got a lot of work to do. And I know all of you that are listening tonight are tuned in to FireSafe Marin. You're partnering with us on defensible space and, and all this other work. But you know, there's a 35% of the population out there mm -hmm. that we have to get their attention. So you know, what I challenge all our listeners to do tonight reach out to your friends, reach out to your neighbors, um, make sure they're signed up for Alert Marin, get them tuned in, you know, create firewise communities that Fire Safe Marin's done a great job championing. Really, this is about, you know, a partnership. We're not going to be able to fix this on our own as the government. There's no silver bullet. There's no single thing that we can do to change. It really is a host of things that need to change, and it's all about a partnership. So. Our, our community members really need to engage with us. We want to engage with you. you know, Todd was one of the developers of the software we're using for defensible space. Um, there's a lot of little things that can be done that aren't very expensive, you know, whether it's around your home or the alert and warning system side, uh, that can make a big difference in, in how we reach you uh, and, and whether you're protected or not in the case of a fire. So to the residents, you really need to take some responsibility, do some pre-planning, think through what you would do if something happens. Make sure you're signed up for Nixle and Alert Marin. That makes a big difference. So go bags and all that stuff, that's all part of the pre-planning. There has been a lot of questions coming to Fire Safe Marin about sirens. How, what are sirens and how do they work and uh, how do they fit in here, Marin? So I'd say sirens are one more tool in the toolbox, and they're available in multiple communities across Marin. And we've tested their uh, efficacy and, and how, how we do in certain areas. And you know we're not a perfectly flat place, um, so we're challenged somewhat acoustically by the sirens we have. Um, but they're another tool in the toolbox. They're great for outdoor alert and warning. Um, but you know our homes are designed to reduce traffic noise and other things. So we may not always hear them when we're inside the house. I think what it is, is if you hear a siren, you know, go to your trusted news sources. Um, don't forget things like our AM radio. Um, you know, KCBS is a great example. Um, we're going to be pushing information to our local news uh, outlets and they're gonna be rebroadcasting. So if you hear a siren during, you know, a red flag day or what doesn't seem like should be going off, that should get your attention to prepare your go bag, be ready to go, and then tune in to um, you know, the, the, either the emergency portal at the county and your local news, news stations. But it's one more tool in the toolbox, as I mentioned before, it really isn't a silver bullet to fix this. Yeah, so we really do have a lot of coordination between Nixle, Alert Marin, Wireless Emergency Alert, which is actually also Amber Alerts, so people are pretty familiar with that. We have the NOAA radios, we have sirens out there. We have a lot of systems there. One of the questions that comes up, what happens when the power goes out? Is there backup power and redundancy to these systems? Uh, maybe Mark, you want to talk about that? So for the sirens, most of the sirens do have a backup system and then we are working with the cellular companies to have a redundancy for their cell sites so that we can maintain the, the cellular, cellular coverage that we have. 
and you know Pac Bell or not Pac Bell. I'm sorry, I'm showing my age with that <laughs> one. But yeah. the, the phone Bell. company is uh, working on making sure that all of their switching centers are still alive during power outages. And then that also goes back to the NOAA radios. Their battery backup, uh, great backup for you to have, and those notifications still continue to work. Yeah, and I'm we're pretty confident the cell towers and we're in now backup power and so forth is there. So we really should be able to get through redundancy. We have the NOAA weather, weather radios out there. And I think the most important thing, we've talked to quite a bit about red flag days. The chances of a catastrophic fire are it's almost with a certainty going to be on a red flag warning day. So that's the time to really crank up and pay attention. Todd, what are some of the things that we should do in preparation if it is a red flag warning a day besides just paying attention to alerts? Well, I think it's critical for us to, to just acknowledge that the vast majority of the, the hazard and the, the action that needs to be taken lies with the individuals, the residents in Marin. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the actions that should be taken on a red flag day, the, the first and foremost is, is just situational awareness. You, you, need to, you need to be looking outside, you need to be listening, you need to probably turn the volume down on the television set to pay attention to what's happening outside. Pay attention to the weather. If the wind is, is blowing in a direction that you're not accustomed to, especially from the east or the northeast, when uh, leaves are blowing across your front yard or, you know, God forbid you smell smoke or you have embers or ash falling on your home, those are signs. And those signs all occurred in advance of, uh, you know, the fires in the North Bay, the fires in Northern California over the last decade, and frankly, the fire in, in Maui. Um, uh, there, there were signs in residents who, who caught wind of that, who recognized those signs and reacted early, were the ones who were most likely to get out safely. Um, and and that'll, that'll bear true. So situational awareness is absolutely critical. There are preparations that people should be doing in advance. Chief Weber mentioned, uh, you know, making sure that your go bag is packed and available at your front door, making sure that your animals are cared for in advance, that, you're, that your animals are accounted for, and that, like Fire Safe Marin recommends, getting your dogs and your cats into carriers when the wind is blowing and you're in, a, in the, you know, the, the midst of a red flag warning. Get them where you can quickly uh, locate them and load them into a car because we know people have lost their lives, uh, you know, st staying back to try to find their, their beloved pet cat. We, we don't want that to happen when it was preventable. Um, I, the, the preparedness around the home, and, and this goes uh, really long before the red flag warning, the preparedness around the home on the property itself, whether it's the uh, hardening the structure, improving the building construction, maintaining a clean property, maintaining a, a zone zero within five feet of the structure itself that's absolutely free of combustibles is critical. Um, uh, those are the differences that, 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 the, that the small changes that a homeowner's in control of that will make all the difference and really prevent structures from igniting. And if your home doesn't burn during a wildfire, then you, you can uh, count on it being a safe place to be potentially if you were trapped there during the fire. There's, there's, oh, yeah. there's actually a, a news report that, uh, uh, on that one house that did survive surrounded by houses that did not survive and the residents had taken action. They, they didn't do it for wildfire safety, but they had taken action and they actually followed several, but not all of the recommendations that we were making our residents. First, they started with a non-combustible roof. Yep. They, they, they maintained a combustible siding, but one of our recommendations is non-combustible siding. But one of the key things they did was zone zero. They went out three to six feet around their um, foundation and it was all rock and then they removed all the vegetation that was within that area or vegetation that was climbing on their um, built on their on the structure that one home survived we see examples of that in every fire the yeah. north bay fires the fires in southern california the, the the campfire there are homes that survive and there are reasons that those homes survived and sometimes it's luck sometimes people made change changes for cosmetic reasons and didn't realize they were benefiting themselves when a fire occurred, but the, the fact of the matter is there are some really simple steps, inexpensive oftentimes, that can make a huge difference for your property. Zone zero is a great one. It doesn't require changing the structure, it's just removing things that are close to Let's the Let's pause on this for a second because I think it's, you know, what can neighborhoods do collectively? Yeah. Um, and when you look at home hardening and defensible space around a structure and you take that from one home to the next to the next and all of a sudden you now have a neighborhood that is more defendable. Um, one, I feel a lot more comfortable with our wonderful firefighters being in there um, because they're hanging it out on the line often 
um, at the expense of someone not doing their defensible space and home hardening. We're asking them to go in there and protect your structures, which, which certainly they're paid to do, but an unreasonable risk isn't fair to them. So you're giving them more space to work. Um, but two, you look at what occurred in Lahine and uh, that fire spread, and it really wasn't the vegetation as much as it became structure to structure ignition. And that's what we're seeing in these fires um, that have substantial losses. You look at Coffee Park in Santa Rosa um, or some of the other examples, there's many. This is building to building ignition. And it's the embers that are in this fire front that are catching those homes on fire and it just propagates one after another. So if all of a sudden we can start to take that out of the equation and less homes are on fire uh, and, and less homes are being exposed to fire because they have good defensible space and they're, they're unhardened, now all of a sudden we start to have a neighborhood and a community that is that much more protected. So your effort on your individual house um, isn't just for you, it's really for everyone. So I think if we change the, the look of that or how we look at that um, and realize let's not be selfish and not do this, you really are affecting your entire neighborhood. Now, we've compared it to herd immunity before. You really, everybody needs to participate and, and it begins to spread. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of questions, but I see most of them are action are related to sort of intricacies of evacuation itself. So let's begin with this. So Mark, the MWPA funded a literary, literature review of evacuations all around the world. Can you tell us what came out of that and what the main things people should be aware of? Yeah, so um, thank you, Rich, for bringing that up. The, the MWPA's Evacuation Ingress Egress Risk Assessment started with a literature review, and we dug into fatal fires throughout the world and found we were looking for the commonalities between these, fa these fatalities that occurred during um, these events. And uh, number one was they were under extreme fire weather conditions, so the red flag. So having everyone be prepared under red flag and kind of ready to go is key. Number two, the vast majority of them is because pe um, that people either didn't get the message in time or they chose not to evacuate until it was far too late. And uh, so evacuate early. And what do you risk by evacuating early? You, it, there's, it would, let's say the fire doesn't get there. Oh, okay, so you took a little drive away from your house. Um, so we really encourage residents to evacuate early. And the last one is have a trusted information source. And we are working hard in Marin to create that trust with our community that when we say it's time to evacuate, it's time to evacuate. When we say you have an evacuation warning, you're packing up and you're ready to go. And you may even leave if you know that you have some issues that you have to deal with that make it harder for you to evacuate. But we really are working hard to be that trusted information source. And Rich, I think there's an important piece here. Um, you know, we have, we're, we're fortunate in Marin, we have, you know, 40 fire engines available to us, 13 ambulances, a considerable amount of law enforcement, but we don't know where every elderly and non-ambulatory person is. You guys do. You live in these neighborhoods. You know that, you know, Mrs. Smith next door is hard of hearing um, and isn't going to move fast. It's an incumbent upon all of us to make sure we know our neighbors and that we, when we're evacuating, we're making sure Mrs. Smith or Mr. Smith next door or down the street is ready to go. And I think it also highlights the importance of Firewise communities, getting to know your neighbors, um, but also being a part of the solution. And we talk a lot about that responsibility tonight. You know, it's, 40 fire trucks can go very fast when you have, you know, hundreds of homes threatened and the fire to fight itself plus law enforcement working on the evacuations and traffic control and other things. So it's really important that neighbors start to think of each other, of how are we gonna get out together? Yeah. Maybe conversely, if you are, I sort of think of it sometimes as mobility channel challenge. You don't have a car, you're slow moving, whatever it is. Um, you really do need to be thinking ahead and doing some planning. So what are some of the recommendations for somebody who themselves realize that I don't have a car or it's hard for me to get around. What should I be doing? What should I be thinking about ahead of time to prepare for an event like this? 
You really got to have a, a you know a channel of communications with somebody you trust and who has the ability to help in advance. You can't wait until the fire starts. Communications get difficult even under the best circumstances. Uh, you know, uh, uh, phones may be slower. It may be more difficult to reach people. So you have to have a plan in advance. You have to if you don't have mobility, you have to you, you know be be thinking in advance. You have to make arrangements with a, fr a friend, a family member. Um, I'll let people know uh, what that plan is, have a communications plan in place, uh, you know, have a backup uh, uh, to all of these. Uh, it's uh, important we found people who lost their cell phones and had no way to reach their family members because they don't know their phone numbers anymore, and, and we see that increasingly. So, so uh, you know, for those people, and there are quite a few in Marin, uh, you know, like, like Chief Weber said, understanding who they are, uh, recognizing who your neighbors are, and being able to band together as a community is, is critical. Uh, uh, you know, the, the fewer fire resources that are involved in rescues during a, a fire, uh, the better off we are because those firefighting resources can be engaged in slowing the spread of the fire and, and they can make, those 40 fire engines can make a real difference in slowing the spread of fire, which buys everybody time. As soon as the fire engine is committed to rescuing people, they're no longer putting water on the fire, they're no longer slowing the spread of that fire. And I think, you know, you've got a a lot of good points there. Um, one of the things we haven't covered yet, and I think it's important, we hear it a lot, I want to evacuate to the open space, or there's a fire road near my house, I think that'll be quicker than the main road. And, you know, I'm fearful that in evacuation, I'm going to perish in my car. And I know, Todd, you did a lot of research after the campfire. Um, we've seen a lot of information. MWPA has studied this, and I think there's some key elements here. You're safer on a paved road, especially if you're in the hills heading downhill towards the valley floor. I think, Rich, you've said multiple times, you know, the route you take to the grocery store is probably the appropriate route. There are no magical roads or tunnels that exist in this county, and evacuating into the open space is quite dangerous, um, whether that's on foot or in a vehicle. You know, especially on non-maintained roads, you, you know, everybody's in panic mode. You, the first car drops a tire off, and, and the rest are, are logged on there and jammed. And one other thing came to thought when you were talking about planning, and I'm gonna to point towards Rich here and maybe reverse the, the <laughs> questioning, but FireSafe Marin is a great resource. So if you're looking for evacuation plans or a go bag list or any of these other items, maybe Rich, if you could talk and, and tell people where they can find that on FireSafe Marin and how useful that is, because that's where we're pointing our residents. Great, thanks. Well, FireSafe Marin, our website's very robust. There's entire sections which are dedicated to what we think of as personal preparedness. Talks about how to get alerts and warnings, what to do on a red flag warning day, all the precautions you should take for evacuation, and has a lot of tips for people who don't have a car or for other reasons might have a challenge to get out, um, what to do if the power goes out. So the website's really good. And then we've done a lot of events like this, Wildfire Watch TV or webinars, and we have a ton of videos on Fire Safe Marin's YouTube channel. So you want to check that out. Tons of information there. And then, of course, you can always email us or phone call us. We get back to people most of the time on the same day. We're glad to help you out. Um, with all that, I'm going to kind of synopsize some of the things we've been said, saying so far. So obviously, in order to be safe in evacuation, you have to pre-plan. So you've got to think about this ahead of time. You've got to think about what you're going to do. This is a common question that comes up here. The next thing is that you really should be sure that you're signed up for the alerts and warnings. If you don't get those, that's one of the big causes. Pay particular attention on a red flag day. That's the days that the catastrophic event is gonna happen. It's only a few days a year. If you are somebody who knows that you might be challenged with transportation issues and whatnot, you want to have connections which are close nearby you. So obviously, neighbor helping neighbor, that's great. So you want to get to know your neighbors. But for those who have the resources, that might be a good time to have a loved one or a caretaker stay overnight with you for the couple of days that that happens. So there's somebody actually there to assist you. You can't be calling your sister who lives two hours away to come and get you and count on that. It just takes too much time. So you've got to think through these things a little bit ahead of time. If you have the resources, and you're in a very difficult situation, you may even want to consider on the very few days that it looks like it could be really bad fire weather, you may even consider moving out and staying with a friend somewhere else. So those are options, but you have to take a little bit of responsibility for that because there's no way we can pre-plan. 
Now we get into the next thing, and there's probably 15 questions about this. I live in an area with one road in and one road out. What do I do? I, I, I'll, just to, because it ties into what you were just saying, Rich, I, I think w w you know we need to look at this question under the under the, the, the broader look at evacuation in general. We cannot allow a single car to leave a community with an empty seat in it during a wildfire. And that means picking up your neighbor who might need assistance. You know, the old lady that lives next door, I, she should be filling a seat in your car. The fewer uh, empty seats we have means the fewer cars we have on the road, which will definitely contribute to an orderly evacuation. Our roads are not designed to accommodate mass traffic like, like a, a, you know, a wildfire is going to generate. And we're doing things to improve those conditions, but we, we don't have the option of building multi-lane highways out of the small communities in the hills of Marin. So I think it, it, you know, we really need to focus on that, that community organization and making sure that we do not have cars leaving those communities with empty seats. There's nothing we can do that, that's going to reduce traffic more than that. Um, I, and I, I think it, if it's okay, now is an opportunity for us to just acknowledge that what, 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 what we do know that there were fatalities in cars in Maui. Um, and I, I, my inbox filled up over the weekend with people saying, hey, you know, I thought you told us that we were safer in our cars. And we did say that, and we have said that, and we still stand by that. The car is the safest place for you to be. And the fact that there were fatalities during the Oakland Hills fire in 1991 in Portugal in 2015 in cars doesn't change the fact that it is still the safest way for you to evacuate. Uh, uh, you know, frankly, uh, it, this was a tragedy. And if you had been outside of your car on the highway in Lahaina, you, you simply would have been injured or killed faster than inside your car. And, and, you know, whether there are lessons that we can learn from this and changes we can make to evacuations, I, I think we probably will, but uh, in the short term, we don't want the community to see the fact that there were fatalities in cars and make a decision to evacuate on foot. That's, yeah. that's gonna contribute to more tragedy. And, and, and maybe I can touch on a little bit more about the evacuation ingress egress risk assessment. So this risk assessment isn't just about the wildfire danger. So we are evaluating the wildfire danger for every roadway within our jurisdiction. But we're also looking at the traffic infrastructure. How wide is that road? How many turns are in that road? What is the parking like on that road? What's the, are there stop signs? Are there traffic signals? And one of the things that we've done with the traffic modeling is how many, how many cars per resident is evacuating. And if you start getting to two residents or two homes per car, the evacuation numbers, it's the speed at which we can evacuate people out of their communities goes up big time. If you have one car or two, three cars, which often happens during an evacuation, or an RV towing a boat, then the evacuation time um, increases dramatically. So you choosing to take your RV with your boat behind it, you're actually putting other people at risk. The other thing that we're evaluating with the ingress egress risk assessment is uh, our ability to communicate alert and warnings to our public, but we're also um, bringing in human um, dynamics and human decision making. So now we're able to, to identify which roads are the riskiest roads, and not only why are they that they're risky, but we know why. So for the one way in, one way out um, communities, which most of Marin is quite frankly, right? Uh, our law enforcement agencies are actually are able to start leaning forward on a red flag day. They may make certain roads uh, one way only to bring you people into the community and then one way out. They also may start limiting parking to help the, the increase the ingress egress. But as we've said many, many times, there are no magical roads that pop up when we have an evacuation. The roads that you drive every day are the roads that you're gonna evacuate on. So that's why we are working so hard for vegetation management along the roadways so that you can be safe while you evacuate. I think it's fair to say that we're not going to be making massive infrastructure changes, digging tunnels through mountains, or making eight-lane freeways in Marin. It's just not practical. It's not why we chose to live here. So if you, we realize if you live in one way in and one way out, you're not going to be a lot of choice in there. I do hear people say, well, there's an easy answer that I'll just take the fire road out. I, I had a conversation with a resident today that lives on, on the coast and had talked about um, watching the, the, the fire in Maui and how people were dying in their cars right up against the water. And so we did talk about some of the difference between Lahaina and, and Marin and a nice gentle slope that Lahaina has 
and the, the wind that can just contour all the way down to the coast as opposed to our steep terrain. But we also talked about what was burning along those roadways. And what was burning along those roadways was either homes or 20, 30 foot high, dead, decadent, dying sugarcane that has not been maintained since the sugarcane plants went away. So we're talking hundreds of feet in flame length right up against these vehicles. So, um, but the conversation was, well, if I go down slope and I get down to the coast, or I can go up slope to a fire road and get away from the fire. And as I explained, first of all, the winds are much stronger higher we are in elevation. Wind is driving that fire. Wind is what is going to kill you. And if you go from a lower elevation to an upper elevation, you're probably going from an area of less risk to an area of greater risk. And we want you to go from an area of risk to less risk. So uphill just combats that. Plus, most fire roads have a gate. Any evacuation plan that has a locked gate is designed for failure. And many of the fire roads, passenger vehicles just cannot go down them or up them. Yeah. So we really, if you're living on a hill, a lot of people in Marin, the most important thing is get down to what we call the valley floor. Heat does rise and go up and away. That's your biggest likelihood of success down there. There may be traffic, but we should be able to get through it. Nothing's 100%, but looking pretty good. But there's another thing that we've started looking to and actually identifying. Maybe, Todd, you can talk about temporary areas of refuge. Yeah, I, you know, we have dozens of examples now uh, of successful, uh, uh, you know, survival during wildfire evacuations by large groups of people who take shelter in what we're calling them temporary areas of refuge because, uh, it, you know, it encompasses a whole wide range of different locations, things like parking lots, uh, you know, school playgrounds, any place that, that's sheltered from vegetation, usually at least 100 feet from vegetation on all sides. Uh, that might be a, the, the center of a golf course, that might be the, the you know, a, a playing field. Uh, it might be a wide roadway uh, in, in some cases, but they're places where people can congregate and take shelter while the fire passes over. And I think survival during a wildfire to firefighters, it, it, it's really easy for us to understand the dynamics of the fire. The fire passes through quickly. The, the fuel is consumed quickly, usually within you know, seconds or minutes. And once that fire's passed through and the, the fuel is consumed, it's now a survivable place to be. So you need to find a place that protects you from that heat and shelter just for a few minutes while the fire moves past you. That's the case in Lahaina. That will be the case uh, you know, during fires in the future in Marin and all over the West. And we know that those temporary uh, you know, refuge areas are places where people can survive if you learn to recognize them. Big areas, open areas like parking lots, golf courses, et cetera. So we're very aware of the importance of evacuation routes. We're still recommending that the car is the safest methods go. Leave early, be pre-planned. That's how you're gonna get out there pretty quickly. Pay attention, alert and warnings. If you think figure it's gonna happen on a red flag warning day. But we've been proactive and beyond that. And I think this is with MWPA funding, so any of you guys can take this, about clearing the vegetation on primary evacuation routes. How much of that have we done? That's a great question, and that was actually one of the, um, when the MWPA was first formed, that was our first course of action, was we didn't wait for the evacuation, ingress, egress, risk assessment to start uh, clearing our roadways. We knew as firefighters what our most dangerous roadways were. So uh, we went through the environmental compliance, and year one, we started beginning our, our work along our evacuation routes, hundreds of miles of work and we are successfully clearing those routes, and we know that it's a forever project, that after we uh, do the clearing on one roadway, we're probably gonna have to come back in a year or two, or depending on the type of vegetation, sooner or longer. But uh, we have made a, a huge dent in it. That being said, we still have a lot of work left to yeah. do. No, I think he hit it on. There's a couple questions I saw um, that, that I thought I'd cover. One of them is, you know, how do I know if I've signed up for Alert Marin or it was some time ago that my information's still accurate? So for any of our viewers or listeners tonight or those watching the recording, you can reach out to uh, the Office of Emergency Management in Marin County, and that's uh, emergency.marincounty.org. They have a contact us piece. They can type in their information, ask their question. They'll receive a response back, and then... Uh, they can also call 415-473-4381 and leave a message and someone will get back to them with that information. Okay, that's great. I think that's important. 
Um, again, people are concerned that, well, what happens if we're trying to evacuate and a tree falls down on our road and it blocks it? What are you guys going to do? That's a, that is a common occurrence, and um, that also ties into our community preparedness. That when you are doing, first of all, when we're doing our evacuation route clearing, we're doing it knowing that traffic jams are inevitable, and so that you will be safe on that roadway, number one. Number two, if our residents start creating defensible space around their homes, you actually start creating temporary areas of refuge for evacuees. If they, for some reason, they get blocked, they can perhaps pull into a driveway of a home that's done a fantastic job of creating defensible space. There's two options there. Of course, uh, notifying 911 so that we can get a fire engine up there to cut the, the tree out or uh, a bulldozer or some way of removing the tree. But to me, it's um, what we call it on the fire ground, it's called tactical maneuvering. You might have to move forward a little bit, you might have to move backwards, but you'd be surprised what 10, 15 feet of movement does for your risk. Let's talk a little bit about that because I think that geography is important and also when we're going to prioritize. People often ask us, you know, what happens if the road's blocked by a tree that falls? Well, if we know that is a principal evacuation route for many residents, we are going to prioritize keeping that open above fighting the fire. So I think Chief Lando talked a little bit about how we direct resources. We may start fully engaged and we will in putting the fire out. If the fire is moving faster than our resources are capable of doing, that battalion chief that's on scene will redirect resources, and oftentimes it will be to evacuate residents, to keep a roadway that we know is a strategic evacuation route open. Um, they all have saws in their engines. They can open that road wide enough for an evacuation route very, very quickly. Um, so that is the, the transition that occurs on an incident um, because we're communicating. We know that we've got a blocked road. We know that road has to be open. We'll redirect fire resources, and Mark mentioned a bulldozer. I mean, it, it, and I think it's important for people to understand you're on the safest route possible. It doesn't mean you're going to be comfortable. You, you know, really you have to work on how do I remain calm in this situation? Um, because the, the, the more calm you are uh, and the more directed you are, the better the evacuation is going to be. And when I still picture videos in my head in 1991, the Oakland Hills fire and the panic, people honking and running into each other. And if, if everyone could stay calm and orderly, and, and of course you're not all firefighters and we don't expect that you're gonna respond or act as we would um, because we're in these events somewhat regularly, but that, that calm, you know, uh, deliberate uh, tr travel and, and maintaining awareness and not panicking is, is what's gonna get everybody out safely. It's a couple, couple more key points if you don't mind with me on this. The evacuation ingress or evacuation uh, route work that we're doing, removing vegetation, one of the things we're doing is removing the unhealthy trees that are unlikely to fall. So we do think that we're increasing or decreasing the chances that trees will fall down. Um, then the other thing is people get out of their cars when there's a traffic jam and they leave their car right in the center of the road. That ends up being the traffic, the, the car that creates a traffic jam in the future. For so, if you do feel like you have to get out of your car, think about the person that's going to be coming in behind you. Because, like Todd said, eventually the fire behavior is going to die down. And so, if you um, leave that car in the middle of the road, you're going to just block someone else once that tree has been removed or the fire behavior has stopped. Mark, you bring up a good point. One of the lessons we learned after the campfire was for those abandoned vehicles that are in the road. You know, especially for new new pickups and SUVs, a lot of plastic. Well, on our chief officer vehicles, we've installed push rams that you'd see on a police car, and that's for that exact reason. We can clear a tree, we can you know clear another car. So those are some of the lessons learned from other events that have occurred that we've implemented here, in Marin. It just it reminded me of that. It's something we've done. I, I, I just want to want to add that you know we've looked through the evacuation study and just analyzing what's happened in these fires and and we've seen a lot of people get out of their cars and evacuate on foot and they're putting themselves at great risk. In most of those situations it was it was a bad decision and I, I hate to second guess people who may may have done this. I know some. I've got some friends who abandoned their cars but, but those were typically the, the wrong decision to make. It's not to say every time, but abandoning the car was something they did out of frustration of being stuck in traffic, fear, and panic. And staying in the car, even in traffic, might have been a better decision most of the time. So we've had, in the last five years, quite a few major wildfires in just in Northern California. And how 
probably hundreds of thousands of people by now who've been evacuated in those fires. What's the experience in terms of safety for most of those people in all those fires that we've done in terms of successful evacuation? Well, this is gonna sound weird, but let's talk about the campfire. 40,000 people live in paradise. It's, it's, it's terrible that 85 people perished, but think about the remaining number of people that successfully evacuated. And then let's look, if we look um, here locally in Marin, our biggest example of an evacuation is the Vision Fire. 1995, the, the, and the evacuation notification systems that we have now in place in Marin are so much better, light years better than what we had in 1995. And that fire, by the time we knew that that fire was gonna impact the Inverness Ridge, it do, and we sent the notifications out, that fire was on the community quickly and nearly 400 people evacuated safely without the systems that we have in place, the notification systems that we have, the community awareness that we have, and the evacuation route improvements. So if you, and then let's look at 2017 in the North Bay versus 2020 in the North Bay. So Evacuations in 2017 in the North Bay, I lived it, my community was evacuated. People got into crashes. In, in, in within communities that weren't even ordered to evacuate yet. They were just being uh, leaning forward and taking, being taken that cautious route. 2020, the evacuations that occurred were orderly. I, I've seen countless evacuations from a professional side. I saw it from a personal side. It was one of the most orderly evacuations I ever saw. So we got practice by fire, but our communities here in Marin, we want them to get practice by actually participating in evacuation drills. So most evacuations actually are relatively successful. Pre-planning is important. Pay attention on the red flag warning days. Make sure you're signed up for the alerts and pay attention to that. Be the first one to leave. If you know you might be helped, something you pre-plan a little bit, stay in your car, lowest point in the valley, work your way through it. In some cases, temporary area of refuge may also be an option for you. So there are quite a few options that are out there. And if people take advice and do that, most of us are going to get out safely and it's going to facilitate the firefighters being able to do their work. So, go ahead, Chief. Rich, it just it struck my mind as we talk about this. I get a question a lot of times is, I, I want to see an evacuation plan for my house that's set in stone to where I'm going to go. And I think that you know all of these fires have given us examples that they're dynamic. They may come from one direction or another. They may impact one road or a community more than another. And so what we'll use is that alert and warning system. When we do evacuate a certain section, we're gonna provide instructions to them. You know, it's, it's go to a temporary refuge area at the Safeway parking lot. It's going to be go to the, you know, high school XYZ um, as, as your location and take your normal route there. So I want people to understand that you're not being provided a, a cut and dry evacuation plan because every situation is gonna be a little bit different. And I, I think there's an uneasiness about that with our residents, but they have to understand that we use law enforcement and we'll use our evacuation alert and warning systems to provide those instructions. And it allows us, if they're registered, to be dynamic. And if things change, we can send a new alert or update them. Yeah, the so there's been a lot of a focus sure. on evacuation because that's really where the bulk of the questions are. We get that, but some of the other actions that we're taking Marin contribute to reducing the risk from wildfire. Let's talk a little bit about the um, large fuel break projects that are out there. Yeah, we've, we're now undertaking uh, uh, significant fuel break projects in almost all of the, uh, the zones for the MWPA. We started last year in the central zone, which runs really from Fairfax to Corte Madero with a 38 mile shaded fuel break that's in, encircling the entire community. And it, it, you know, uh, it's really important for us to emphasize, we've said this now a thousand times, this, is, this fuel break is not intended to stop a wind-driven fire like the, like the one that just happened in Lahaina or the Camp Fire, the North Bay fires, to stop it in its tracks when it reaches the edge of the community. What these fuel breaks are doing is creating a buffer between the community and the wildlands where the fires typically make a transition. Most of these fires have started in the wildlands, they spread into the community, and what the, these fuel breaks will do is reduce the fire behavior at the edge of the community in many cases, it will give firefighters a chance to stop a fire, a small fire that's just started at the edge of the community. 
In, in many other cases, it's gonna provide reduced fire behavior, which will allow residents additional time and additional safety to evacuate from their homes. And it provides this a buffer, a continuous buffer that we've never had around the entire community. It allows people to enhance the defensible space around their homes, a reduction in fire behavior at the edge of the community. And this, this is what the science has shown us, uh, uh, is the, the single best action we can take to reduce the likelihood that the community will become involved involved in, in uh, you know, a conflagration, assuming the residents, the individual residents have taken on their responsibility of building defensible space and hardening their homes. So all of these things have to be integrated, they all have to work together, but this is the one big project that we can undertake continuously for each of the zones in Marin that, that can really make a difference and enhance the work that's being done at the individual homeowner level. Yeah. So was it really the intention of tonight's conversation to talk a lot about the creating a defensible space around the home and hardening your home, but we know that's critically important because a lot of homes are burning down because they're not, the home itself is not properly prepared. If it is, it can withstand wildfire. The next level out are these shaded fuel breaks, and they're massive, but so I forget if you said the mileage, but like, 38 miles for, for just one of the fuel breaks, and the Nevada fuel break is even longer. Yeah, so, hundreds of miles in picture. Here's the, our communities, here's these fuel breaks, but there is a lot of land and there's kind of a trend in some of the questions. Who's responsible for all that other land and what are they doing and isn't it, aren't they the ones that are creating all the problems? So yeah, I think that it's, it's natural to look up at the hillside and say that's the problem. I see a lot of vegetation when we know that, that the closest to the home, like that example in Lahaina that we gave, um, is the most important. But we've got some major landowners that we're very close partners with here in the county. Uh, GGNRA, National Park Service, Point Reyes National Seashore, we work continuously with them. We have an agreement with them to augment our fire crews that are out doing daily work, vegetation management in and around the borders there. Uh, the Marin County Open Space District, another partner on multiple uh, projects throughout the county. Again, another partner with our, our fire crews on doing vegetation management work in and around their properties. Uh, Marin Municipal Water District, another partner uh, that borders a lot of homes. So uh, California State Parks, uh, when you look at some of the parks that are around. So we're regularly engaged with all of those landowners and looking where these larger fuel breaks are going, our vegetation management work that's being done, uh, focusing on those that are adjacent to evacuation routes or homes, expanding that defensible space piece remains the same. Additionally, you know, when you look at what's happening with, with overall forest health, um, there's a lot of work going into, and a lot of money, um, uh, for state, state and federal grants to look at how we start to, to mechanically remove some of this vegetation that historically was done through natural fire. Um, those are all things that are happening simultaneously, but as we promised our voters with Measure C and that money, we're going to start at the House and go out from there. And I think it's important to remember we're only three, three years into this program and we're already making enormous progress, which is fantastic. But, but really we know that around the homes, around the communities is the most important. Start working out from there. I think there's another point that we didn't cover tonight, and that's the amount of grant funds that we've been successful in obtaining in this county to, to augment the money that we're being provided through Measure C or local dollars, um, and that's huge. And we're talking 10 plus million dollars, I think, just in the last few years um, to fund projects and programs around here. So we're really capitalizing on that uh, and making a lot of progress. So accompanying the grants, maybe Tom could address this, how's the home evaluation program fit into the grants and helping homeowners understand what they need to do to prepare their homes. Well, there's a couple different types of grant programs. There's the grants that Chief Weber is mentioning. It, you know, we're bringing in Cal Fire grants and federal grants to work on large-scale projects. But we also manage within the MWPA itself a smaller grant program that can help individual homeowners with with uh, uh, you know completing the defensible space and home hardening work around their their home can offset some of the costs involved with that. So we, we have a, a robust, probably the most robust in the state, the defensible space inspection program. Um, uh, all of the zones in Marin, uh, in the MWPA are participating in this and we're inspecting over 30,000 structures annually, providing uh, you know, really detailed analysis of uh, vulnerabilities of 
um, defensible space issues of home hardening vulnerabilities and providing homeowners with resources to access grants to, uh, to fix those issues when we find them. It, it's a successful program. We're getting great feedback. We're learning a lot and then we're building a, a, a data set that's going to help us understand fire risk and really help us focus future grants and future work on the community and the places where the, the, the biggest vulnerabilities exist. And as Chief Weber pointed out, programs like this are allowing us to document the improvements that are being made. And we're only a few years into this, but when we're in four or five years in, and we're looking with years of data, and we see all of the vegetation homeowners removed, all the action they've taken, all the grant dollars that are put out there, all this work that we're doing on these bigger projects, it will be a remarkable improvement. It's never gonna be perfect, there's always a lot of work to do, but it's making a lot of improvement. An interesting question came up, Chief, was about, well, how do you spot these fires? Can you talk about the fire camera programs? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of technology, again, has come forward in the last few years. Um, one of the things we have, and Mark was integral in, in obtaining a lot of the cameras and expanding the system, but we have available to us on Alert California the ability to look at a good portion of this county, um, and we can, you know, early on see what a fire is doing um, you know, and a, and a chief officer can look at that and work with the dispatch center to augment uh, the response earlier, augment the amount of aircraft we have coming. But I think what, what is also happening simultaneously is, is artificial intelligence is being integrated into these camera systems where they're now starting to recognize the fire. The early technology, that just wasn't there when we first put the cameras in, uh, would falsely alert with fog or any kind of change in the, um, the skyline where this AI is, is, is much better. So again, those cameras are up there 24 seven and are able to see things very early and alert us um, in, in the command center and our dispatch center of, of a, the beginning of a fire, maybe even before somebody can call 911 or in areas that are less travels, less visited, less visited or have terrible cell coverage, which we know there's quite a few in Marin. Um, so that technology is available to us. I mentioned the aircraft that's available. So if we do get a report of a fire, especially at night, or we want that intelligence on it, um, we can request that aircraft. They're strategically located in the state. Their flight time's very quick. They're up above all of the other firefighting aircraft so that they don't interrupt the operation itself. But unlike 2017 and the Tubbs fire, um, you know, it was very difficult to see the progression of that fire at night and where it was other than anecdotally by 911 calls and other stuff. So that technology is available to us as well. And I think, you know, there's commercial satellites starting to come online um, that have early detection, early warning. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of great technology that's really gonna help us. And, you know, I just look at in the short five years from 2017, kind of when, when we really started to see these devastating fires occur more regularly, certainly in the north side of the state, how far we've come with technology and what we have available to us. Yeah, so I think, um, I think we should all be kind of happy in a way that so many good things are happening in Marine here. We're really, there's a lot of changes. It keeps evolving over time. Residents have been very supportive of these programs by supporting things like Measure C, creation of the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority, great fire departments, lots of technology, lots of resources. And I think the knowledge base of Marin residents based on our experience at FireSafe Marin is very high. People understand sign up for alert Marin, take action, create plans and so forth. So I know there's a lot of questions that I didn't get to because many of them are very specific. I just want to reassure everybody that give us two or three days and we will provide answers to those which will be pasted on our website. But before I leave, I'd like to give each of you a chance to give us some closing thoughts or remarks or anything you'd like to let everybody know. I'll start with uh, Todd. Well, I, you know, I think we are going to learn some lessons from what's happened uh, in, in Maui. It's a, it happened in a different environment, and, you know, but uh, there are some direct parallels that I think will be very valuable for us uh, in the future to uh, you know, better understand what happens when communities are impacted by fires. That said, the basics still stand. What we've been preaching for several years now, for decades really, uh, uh, is still so valuable that personal preparedness, understanding your situational awareness, having your go bag ready in advance, and doing the work around your home before a fire starts are, are, are the elements that are gonna make all the difference for uh, Marin residents. Yeah, thanks Todd, Mark. So it's, it's easy to get sucked into how painful it is for communities like Lahaina, for, for Paradise, for that tremendous loss of life. And it's 
really easy to turn that around and put yourself in those shoes, what would you do under, those situa under that situation? And I'll just keep that same message. It is all about the work that we're doing now. Every fire that starts, our firefighters are behind. The fire has a head start. So the MWPA and our member agencies, we're working hard with the vegetation management so that our firefighters aren't as far behind, but we can't do it alone. We need our residents to be prepared. They need to know when red flags occur. They need to be ready to evacuate. That is the single best way to prevent fatalities. And then if we do our home hardening, we do our defensible space, we work on our evacuation route clear and our shaded fuel breaks, then the strength of our community is some of its parts. And if everybody does its parts, then we are going to, we won't avoid wildfire. We won't avoid a devastating wildfire, but we can make a significant impact to the loss of life. Chief? I think as you know, we look at this tonight, let's honor those victims in the 2017 fires, the, the Paradise Fire, the Lahaina Fire now, and, and not let you know, that awful devastating loss of life um, go to waste. Let's, let's take this opportunity to learn, to grow. I think Todd and Mark have covered this, you know, everything that needs to be done. This is about a partnership. Uh, I think for all our residents, if you have questions and they've been coming in, um, you know, and I think Fire Safe Marin will answer a lot of those in the next few days, which is fantastic. But reach out to your local fire agency. We are here to partner with you. Uh, this isn't something we can do alone. This really is about community. Get to know your neighbors. You know, we have an aging population here in Marin. We have to take care of folks as they're getting older. And that means helping them. You know, so much of what we talk about today is relying on technology and that not, may not be firsthand for them. So reach out, meet your neighbors, have a plan, uh, learn, visit Fire Safe Marin's website. It is an absolute plethora of information on being prepared and you know all of you tonight I think we're preaching to the choir because you're all doing what we've asked you to do engage go find someone that isn't engaged and share this information with them and Rich thank you and Fire Safe Marin for your leadership um, and bringing everybody together tonight. Great well thanks for the panel for being here and thanks for all of you who took the time to view the program again we look forward to responding to your questions and just reiterating again our concern and compassion goes out to Everybody in Lahaina, for those who like to help, Maui Strong is a, a good opportunity, but there are certainly other organizations always doing a good out, job out there. And we encourage you, if you're able to, to help out. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much again for tonight, and um, we'll uh, see you next time.